I hope you all fasten your seat belts because those who know me know that I use a lot of images uh, very quickly. I'll say a few words about the world we live in as I see it and some of the challenges and then three basic themes, medicine, health and education, food, agriculture and natural resources and technology, industry and the environment. So my friends, let's start with this little prologue. We are living the third global revolution. The first revolution was agriculture. It allowed societies to become sedentarized and civilizations to rise. The second global revolution was the industrial revolution, which transformed not only the means of production, but the relationship between humans and the product that they work on. The third global revolution is the knowledge revolution. We are witnessing an amazing transformation right now where the emphasis is no longer brawn, as we would say, or muscle, but brain. This is where it's coming from. And it's having a major impact in transforming industries, in creating new sectors in areas which didn't exist before. The revolution that we are living is just beginning. We are only beginning right now. The speed of change is phenomenal. The interaction between science, technology, and innovation is great. Sometimes it raises fears in society about the ability to cope with that speed, as practically everything we know gets transformed within a few short years. We talk about the information society or the knowledge society. And data, when it gets organized, becomes information. When it's explained, it becomes knowledge. But is that enough? What we really need to cope with our challenges is wisdom. Wisdom is beyond knowledge. It's in addition to knowledge. The world we live in, however, is one where there is a lot of knowledge, but perhaps not enough wisdom. And that's perhaps something which we shall seek from our distinguished visitors. It is a globalized world where boundaries have been transgressed in many ways. We know the problems, financial markets that have gone out of control, the feeling among many in the developing world and even in the industrial world that the poor are left behind and unable to cope whether they are in the rich countries or in the poor. In the meantime, lifestyles continue unabated, both in energy consumption, in means of transportation, in destruction of our patrimony of natural resources, and in our continuing pollution and its impact on uh, climate change and the greenhouse gases, but also pollution of that most vital of things for life, which is water. Sadly, we are still spending enormously on the military. 16 times more on military spending than on development assistance around the world today, with horrible impacts. And yet, despite what we know about the cost of war, it continues. People can always find money for it. This, to me, is one of the most moving pictures I have seen. But then, of course, I am a librarian, so I am deeply moved by the child holding the books. I think that it is uh, depriving also human rights. It's not just political and civil rights, but access to knowledge, ability to learn, to flourish is part of human rights. And I would say that it is not enough to celebrate the earth and its inhabitants, that we must restore what we have destroyed. We can see the possibilities. We have an unlimited transformation in our ability to communicate around the world. There is a gaining ground for the notion that we have a common humanity and all should share in human rights. A global consensus was formed, not just about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in 1948 and subsequent instruments, but even about the Millennium Development Goals. And yet, my friends, and yet, my friends, the first and most essential of the Millennium Development Goals, the one that would try to fight poverty and hunger, is going the wrong way. Now, why is this all wrong? Because, in fact, what we need above all to implement these images, these goals, is peace. 
I call a witness that you will all recognize, and not just because it's the year of France and Egypt. Napoleon Bonaparte is probably one of the best known figures in history, and the person who actually used the sword somewhat. What you may not know is what he said, reflecting on his life. He said, do you know what astonished me most in the world? The inability of force to create anything. In the long run, the sword is always beaten by the esprit, which would be mind or spirit, depending on how you translate it. So, on reflecting on his life, Napoleon found, in fact, that the lasting contributions he made were those of the foundation of academies of science, the foundation of the National Theatre, the Central Bank, the, the uh, Système de lycées français around the world, and uh, the Code Civil. His military victories and defeats were extremely ephemeral and left no mark on society. So the essential goals, if we're going to go to peace, it is peace and justice, for there is no security without peace, there is no peace without justice, there is no justice without equity, and there is no equity without inclusion. People must be included in the processes that affect them, or else there will be no lasting peace. With that, the future really can be great. Technology is very promising. We already connect young people everywhere in tools that nobody could imagine would exist. We've expanded our brain's reach in avenues and means that are beyond belief and a whole lot more. And the current moment, I know people will say, we've had these ter terrible, terrible impacts of the financial crisis, but I see a silver lining in it. Global markets and the knowledge-based economy that got people to see the trillion dollar markets and maybe, yes, they did go overboard in unchecked fashions and they did blow a fuse in the financial markets of the world and at huge cost to people in real cost in terms of unemployment and other problems. But there's a silver lining. First, for the first time, we are able to really have a proper debate on the role of government regulation and the private sector and not just a knee-jerk reaction that governs best, that governs least, private sector will do it all. Secondly, we have a new administration in the United States which is willing to look for multilateral solutions, recognizing that many of our problems cannot be resolved by a single country, no matter how big or how powerful. And thirdly, there's a greater awareness that global environmental problems will require collaboration across boundaries and that, in fact, we must all get together even if that has escaped us in Copenhagen. So the best outcome would be new opportunities for the South, for the developing world, but only if the South can master science, education, and develop its own scientists. And here we are facing inequality of access to resources. If rich countries in per capita income have 40 times the income of the poorer countries, they are actually spending on per capita terms 220 times more on research every year. It's an amazing figure. And yes, therefore, there are some of the poorest people in the world. That lowest billion that is still hungry today is being left behind. And the mystery of economic growth is that it is lifting up many parts of the world, including huge swaths of humanity like in China and parts of India, but it is leaving behind others. Inequality of access to equipment. Here is a preschool in, uh, in uh, Germany, and here is a school in sub-Saharan Africa without even a blackboard, without places to sit on, no chairs for the children. And vast numbers of young children who are, in fact, competing to find their place in the sun and to learn. And maybe, maybe technology will provide them with answers. Our good friend Nicholas Negroponte and Alan Kay were here and presenting the ideas of a $100 computer or less, who knows? There is inequality in access to knowledge. Teachers in many parts of the world need recent, correct, and easily available material. And we're doing our part, and there will be a discussion of the super course later on. So the future is there. The challenges are here. What do we do? Well, for one thing, we are having this meeting and getting together to share ideas about how we can actually make this happen. This is the fifth BioVision we organize in Alexandria. They've all been well attended, I'm happy to say. They, we also have our BioFair and poster sessions 
for younger scientists. The publications from the previous events show the quality of the work that has been done in these previous conferences, and I have every reason to hope that this one will join the rest. But fundamentally, what we want to do is to address the new knowledge revolution. For the biological sciences are poised for a transformation that has no parallel in history. And there, whether it's the knowledge or the method or the technology, they are intertwined. It is very difficult to take them apart. And here in this conference, we will have themes that will come back and forth and are woven together. Themes of medicine, health, and education, of agriculture, food, and natural resources, of technology, industry, and environment. And where, as in BioVision Lyon, we try to have practicing scientists, researchers, as well as people, CEOs of industry being present, as well as members of society at large, like myself. Well, I kind of cover several of these, but nevertheless. Uh, the themes are intertwined, and you will find, therefore, reflections. It's not just sort of completely cut out. You'll find reflections of these issues coming back and forth in the various sessions. Key questions, how does new knowledge generate new technology? And how do new technologies impact on the themes? And how do these groups of actors relate to each of these themes? And if we can immediately see tomorrow, can we dream of beyond tomorrow? Well, I think we can. And uh, I'm very happy to welcome in our midst a lot of very distinguished people who are working on biorobotics who will show you a glimpse of something that we thought was in tomorrow, but it's beginning to happen today. So let me start with medicine, the theme, medicine, health, and education. And I would ask for those who address it to keep in mind the following questions. The first is the global challenges and the priorities in research. Well, we all know that medicine is advancing, that it has life-saving potential. We all know that we benefited from uh, uh, various kinds of medicines. Perhaps that's the most widely used medicine in the world, aspirin, right? That's the, uh, it is uh, uh, important to understand the cost, the obstacles of getting new medicines developed, but will they be within reach? of billions of human beings who need them. Second, as was just mentioned by our minister, the brain drain. We want to turn the brain drain into brain gain, whether by circulation or by collaboration. It's an interesting graph that shows co-authored paper with the US and the percentage of foreign-born uh, PhDs in the US from that country. And you may think it has a direct relationship, but actually what interests me more is looking at that. Why, for the same percentage, one group of countries is getting like four or five times more collaboration than another? What can we do to ensure that this collaboration actually takes place and that therefore brain drain is transformed into brain gain and then hopefully later on into brain circulation? New knowledge, new technologies. It opens amazing new possibilities, but is it affordable? because that brings us to the access to medicines question, which is an important issue. Uh, it was mentioned by Christian Grenier, at any price, what price, what does it cost? And there are ethical questions about clinical trials being done in developing countries by uh, rich countries. We need to think about that and we think about priorities. I'm very happy I sort of dug up that picture yesterday, Elias Zerhouni and myself, had the privilege of being with Bill Gates in Davos in 2003 in the launch of the Gates Foundation uh, Global Health Challenges, which resulted in setting priorities and now really the Gates Foundation has become the biggest donor for assisting health in developing countries. Mobilizing the genetic revolution is the challenge that we have to think of, not just the conventional chemical remedies of the past, but can we, in fact, find ways of dealing with that? That brings us to a way that we've been working on, some of us, on education, epidemics, and action. Why epidemics? You will know very soon. My friend Ron Laporte is here. He's uh, uh, founder of what we call the super course. Now, the super course is basically a series of PowerPoint lectures that are made available for free on the Internet, available to anybody around the world and it's governed by a community of practice, and we create these DVDs and sell them to people. 
uh, for free. Uh, we give them to the, to the, send them to people in, in deans, in medical schools around the world. And Allah, uh, one of, uh, of uh, WHO is here. WHO has helped send them all over the world. But these are to get them in DVD form. But they are online in 34 servers. 3,600 lectures used by 60,000 teachers to reach a million students in 175 countries for free. And what are we planning to do? Well, that was epidemiology. We want to expand it, not just to deliver the, the written material. We want to expand it, and Ron Laporte and Gil Omen and Bin Cerf, who's not here with us, but Gil and Ron are here, and myself, are committed to try to expand it to other areas, including medicine, engineering, IT, environment, and agriculture. So we want to build communities of practice, which we hope will include you and get them to contribute in what we're doing. Now, mind you, a large part of that contribution is work that's already being done because all of the distinguished scientists here are using PowerPoint lectures anyway. So what we want is to get copies of your lectures to be allowed to be given for free to be utilized by people, and we will be launching some spectacular new functionalities to help you use it and contribute to it. So do come and listen to the session on the super course. Theme two on food, agriculture, and natural resources is really uh, addressing the need for us to challenge what's happening in global agriculture. And I was very happy to be with Dr. Adel Beltagi and others in Montpellier a few days ago, actually two weeks ago to be precise. Uh, we have an unfair, unsustainable system of agriculture in the world today. I mean, that's to make it simple and straight. How? Well, we know the numbers, we know the challenges. So the question is, how do we transform agricultural research into development to respond to these challenges? That was the theme of Montpellier. And the first of these is to recognize what went wrong. What went wrong with the food price crisis of two years ago? It was a devastating experience. Well, it exposed the weakness and fragility of the current world system. First of all, it distorted trade uh, uh, that we know of, that we uh, worry about in terms of subsidies and uh, uh, this cartoon done by my friend Zapiro of South Africa, I think is very indicative how third world farmers are expected to compete with highly subsidized, highly mechanized first world farmers. Uh, let the competition begin, well, not quite fair. Uh, but shortfalls in production, drought in Australia and elsewhere, low global food stocks against a rising demand for food and feed uh, with prices spiked. Now, countries slapped on export bans, and that immediately exacerbated the situation and has now fed a paranoia in importing countries that should this be repeated, there is no guarantee that even if we are willing to put up the money, we will be able to find the food we need. And thus, contrary to trying to optimize global production, people are moving back towards notions of self-sufficiency rather than uh, uh, being able to think differently about food security. There's a huge increase in demand for animal proteins due to high increases in uh, incomes in many parts of the world, especially China. And that will result in needs for, for, for feed because uh, most animals today, animal proteins, are produced by uh, animal feed through farming. And that puts a special weight on, on maize or corn. And we add to that that there was a, a very unfortunate switching to biofuels with an emphasis on using corn, which also helped the spike of food prices that occurred, and that led to, as we called them initially in the United States, the tortilla riots in Mexico in 2007, and here in Egypt we had our own echoes of that at the time, and that's impacting on our policy to this day. My friends, it is wrong to burn the food of the poor to drive the cars of the rich. It is simply wrong. We need a second generation of biofuels. And 
I think there is a lot to be done in, from cellulosic grasses to biodiesel to algae. There's a lot of very, very interesting prospects that need to be done. We need to advance on biofuels, not in this way. There's biomass, there's a lot of other forms of biofuels, but we need to think of it without polarizing the issue around these issues. So we need fair trade, sustainable production, improved access for all. And hopefully, out of that, we will be able to go back to that first Millennium Development Objective, which was to abolish hunger. It, regretfully, the Millennium Development Goal was cast in 2000 to reduce the number of hungry people from 850 million to 425 million, instead of which it has gone up to 950 million and now has crossed the billion mark in terms of people who are chronically malnourished. An enormous gap exists between rich and poor in the countries. Not, I'm not talking about globally because the movements in China and East Asia have affected the global figures, but within China, within India, within Africa, within Egypt, within 96% of the countries, as reported by UNDP, have had an increase in the gap in income distribution internally, rich and poor countries. Only a very few have been able to actually cope with that. So despite global agricultural production, and despite the fact that technically food would be available, in fact, plentiful or not, it is not available. And even in certain parts of the world, we are now facing the specter of a return to starvation with images of that kind. So what can we do in terms of policy that links science, agriculture, and research in order to tackle that issue better. We, link to, we need to link research into development, as was said in Montpellier. We need to focus on smallholder farmers. They are disproportionately the poor, but they also produce most of the food that is consumed locally. And urban poverty is impacted upon by the capacity of increasing the productivity of the poor farmers. So we need to raise agricultural productivity faster than the way the reduction in prices so that the poor farmers can benefit and the poor who buy the food would increase their access. And we need to measure that in terms of total factor productivity. Land, water, labor, energy, and chemical inputs should all be factored in. And if we improve the nutritional content of the food, there could be enormous health benefits. Biofortification is just beginning as a new technique that we are just studying nowadays. Of course, the most famous of these cases was vitamin A rice, and there are others. And we need to also address, beyond that, the vulnerability of many farmers in the developing world. Now, in Egypt, we rely almost entirely on irrigation. But in many parts of the world, people are dependent on rain and rainfall. And that is a problem. In environments such as these in sub-Saharan Africa, they are totally dependent on rainfall. And rainfall has been erratic, as is variable, but more importantly, over time, there is a reduction in the amount of rainfall, which poses serious problems. So we need to find ways by which extension must bring research to the farmers, to the smallholder farmer, and all should benefit from that result, including the poor in the cities by lowering the price. And that means we have to transform our extension services to how do you link the research to the actual farmers so the farmers benefit and adopt it. Uh, M.S. Swaminathan, who could not be with us today, but is a friend to so many of us, as we're going to celebrate uh, his great partner, the great uh, passing of Norman Borlaug in a special session, he said, uh, Swami said, we are all on this earth as guests of the green plants and those who tend them. And if you reflect briefly, just how true that is, you wonder why those who tend the green plants are so low in the totem pole in our developing countries, yet they are the ones who are making us all live. So agriculture is the key to poverty reduction, to environmental stewardship and food security, and women are the key to food security in agriculture because they play a central role in sub-Saharan Africa. They produce 80% of the food. They receive 10% of the wages. They own 1% of the land. 
Small scale production can be replicated on a massive scale. Uh, we saw that in the case of Kurien and the, the uh, dairy in India, which now outproduces the United States, mostly by organizing smallholder farmers. Research for the poorest is particularly important, and we haven't focused on that yet, because the poorest do not respond easily to market incentives. There's beautiful economic work done by Pata Desgupta on that, and that's why trickle-down doesn't work for them, and special outreach programs are needed to reach people who are in this level of dire poverty around the world and who are at risk of being, uh, uh, in fact, going hungry uh, and potentially of starvation, especially now politically. Again, I go back to my earlier statement about peace. We have more internally displaced persons, which the UN euphemistically refers to as IDPs, which kind of takes the, the edge off of it, but I like to see the picture. I like to see the real human beings behind it. We have tens of millions of people who are displaced in their own countries because of civil strife, if not outright war. As I mentioned a moment ago, gender is extremely important to tackle these kinds of issues. And uh, it is, in the end, practically in every society, the women who build the social capital, who weave together that network of relations that makes a society function. And empowering women is essential to result in major improvements in infant mortality, school enrollments, child morbidity, etc. And women today, in most developing countries, have unequal access to education, health care, income, credit, employment, assets, decision making. Almost every field that you can think of. They suffer um, from the absence of proper systems of water. Uh, they suffer because they have to uh, take to market in, in non-existing conditions. They suffer because they are the ones who are responsible not only for feeding the children, but also for their education and their future. And it is their solidarity together that keeps many of these parts of the world going and allows the transfer of good values of collaboration where others would see conflict. Now, biotechnology is, of course, one of the most obvious applications of the new biology. And it has a lot of promise, and it's increasingly being applied in very large areas. And if we're thinking of the future challenge to produce more food with less water, less land, less labor, and less chemicals, with an increasing population, how do we deal with this? Well, you can raise the yield ceiling, or you can try to close the yield gap between the current average and the potential that is established in, in, in extension stations. And you have to invest in sustaining the current yield, because if you don't constantly invest in research, the current yield will drop. And I see Dr. Magdi and Dr. Adel and some of our agricultural scientists on this side who know this cast well, as does Maggie, who chaired the board of a number of CGIR centers. So we need technologies for increasing the yield potential. Sometimes it comes from different plant types, so-called super rice structures, fewer tillers, more grain. Uh, a new plant type can increase significantly the output. Uh, this is uh, what we have, 15.2 tons per hectare. Egypt today leads the world in terms of rice output at 8 point something tons per hectare, we could do much better. We have to understand where the losses come from, whether it's weeds, disease, or insects. We can find ways of fighting bacterial blight with transgenics. Here is an example of how bacterial blight resistance can be tagged with molecular markers, how we can find resistance genes very effective against that. And this is stem borer damage, and here you see the stem borer larva from the transgenic rice and the stem borer larva from the control rice below, so we can fight pests in non-pesticide using ways. But also uh, integrated pest management, we want to maximize the use of eco-friendly strategies and minimize the use of toxic chemicals. Biological controls, therefore, are important. This is a conference on biology. We need to study more of that. But always, Remember, we should talk in terms of total factor productivity, land, water, labor, energy, and the chemicals that go into it. And we need technologies for all of that if we are going to significantly increase the productivity from the same amount of land and water that we now have and without being as disruptive and unsustainable as we are. And if we improve the nutritional content, it will have great health benefits, 
and it may even go beyond just food and into vaccines. I mentioned uh, vitamin A rice, which, as you know, could not have been done without transgenics. That was the work of Ingo Patrikas and Ron Bayer. And I also want to mention that, in fact, that's not the only case, the white and golden rice, as it was called. It's also available in sweet potatoes with and without beta-carotene. There's high iron rice. And there's this, my favorite picture, which has nothing to do with pigs. The two pigs, this is from Win Winrock, the two pigs are twins. One was fed regular maize, one was fed quality protein maize. And I think that's quite compelling as an image of what better nutritional content can do that these twins have grown this way. We have barely tapped the potential for uh, fish farming and sea farming, and we're still artisanal in many of these things, but there's a lot of promise for longer, more productive lives. But that has to be done working with natural resources. We are already major disruptors of the ecosystems of the Earth, and probably the most important environmental action is to reduce the need for bringing more land under cultivation, as it will not only be a way of producing more grain, but there may be losses in biodiversity, there may be losses in terms of soil erosion, and water, water is so important. And I'm glad we have many of the world's leading experts in water, including my friend Peter Glick here today. Agriculture uses about 65 to 70 percent of the water today, and the, in the global assessment that was done by IMI, it's about 70 percent, and in our developing countries, it's 80 to 90 percent of the water. And uh, for our food, about a liter per calorie is what we need. So the average person consumes 2,700 calories. To produce them, we need 2,700 liters a day. And we know already the problems that exist in areas like China. The Yellow River, in as early as 1996, did not reach the sea for 220 days. And in Egypt, the Nile has to reach the sea because it washes out the salts of the delta and it reaches Cairo with 12 million tons of salt and reaches the sea with 34 million tons of salt. If it didn't carry that out, all our prime agricultural land would salinize. But we're still using a lot of water. This is an average image of a rice field and we are pumping underground water in many parts of the world to do this with dropping water table in Syria water tables are dropping a meter a, a year for the last 30 years. And this is what it looks like. This is an image I like a lot because people don't imagine what does it mean a lowering water table. This is a communal well in the Sahel and where the water table has been dropping and people have now dug deeper, deeper, and they go down, 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 and they get a few drops of muddy water from the bottom. And when that will disappear, then of course, uh, you have desertification and uh, environmental refugees. Currently, it's between 2,000 and 4,000 tons of water to produce one ton of rice, 1,200 tons of water to produce a ton of wheat on average. We can do much better than that. Simplest immediate way would be to shorten growth duration, to find levees for water management in uneven fields, to do land leveling, and to do soil puddling for transplanted rice, dry sowing of rice, but reducing pollution is also essential. And this is an important part of the CGIR work because people assume that the CGIR tells people to use more pesticides, which it does not. In fact, it argues that dropping pesticide use does not drop the yield of rice beyond a certain level. But all of that is being swamped on the environmental side by what's happening with climate change. And I think this is the most serious issue facing humanity, uh, despite the fact that the, some figures in the IPCC may or may not have been quite precise about whether it is uh, in 2035 or 2070. The trend towards losing the glaciers is real, and uh, the trend towards increasing storms is real. This is from even that uh, well-known scientific journal, the National Geographic, which is a, a popular journal, but it maps the hurricane tracks for 10 years, 1985 to 1995, and then the hurricane tracks in the same area for 95 to 2004. First 10 years, next 10 years, I think we can clearly see that it's increasing, 
and as sea level rise occurs, what is going to happen to a number of countries, including our own, and here's Alexandria, in fact, we will become like a nifty little island because the sea will probably go to Zahir, as we say, in, uh, behind Alexandria. Alexandria is still two meters higher. But on the whole delta, you have a major impact, which you can see here, depending on the estimated rise, the actions that are taken, that anywhere between several thousand square kilometers of cropland could be lost and some millions of people could be affected. So what do we do about that? A special session exists on that today. Now the third last theme is technology, industry, and the environment. And technology has been associated with production, with industry, and it was largely chemical in the past. This uh, image was an advertisement uh, actually uh, from, uh, for a plant in Bhopal. Uh, but it's the same plant that actually produced an accident of toxic fumes, one of the worst industrial accidents in history, where about 2,000 people were, ki were, were killed. Uh, we know that uh, there's a major problem of waste management, toxic waste management, and when you uh, bury it and it leaks, you have these uh, kind of uh, moonscapes where nothing can grow, and especially in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union, we see some areas where radioactive material has leaked. So what can biotechnology do for us? I don't know. But I do know that we are facing an era of convergent technologies, which in Arabic is a nifty acronym because bint means girl, and we want to empower girls and women. But actually, I meant bio-info nanotechnologies are converging in many ways, and transformative research capable of changing the paradigms is taking place. So what's happening in these new industries? Some of you may know the work of Dr. Mustafa Sayed using nanomolecules to kill cancer cells. Uh, there are other ways of dealing with that, including um, everything from DNA computing to locking receptors on a cell. It's beginning to permeate a number of industries. Nano is growing fast, but do we know or have we reflected on what the potential impacts of nano might be on our own bodies if nano particles can, trans, uh, can go through cell walls. New technologies, especially for water, what can we do? We have uh, water needs, the membrane technologies will be discussed, and there are several sessions that are devoted to that, and many others as well. But science is advancing every day on many fronts. And Arthur Clarke had this great quotation saying, any technology that is sufficiently advanced seems like magic. And just reflect, if I told somebody 20 years ago that we would stand here, hold the little device that's smaller than my hand, and that you could, unconnected to any wires, just punch in a number and find one particular individual out of the six and a half billion people on the planet, and that the person would speak to you immediately, and that uh, you would be able to find that person whether they were in Australia or Europe or Latin America or in Cairo or next door. Uh, most people would have thought that this is unbelievable. Today, not only we take mobile phones for granted, we start saying, oh my God, look, it's taking so long to get connection. <laughs> right? we, become, <laughs> we become very impatient. So there are many examples, but in this conference we are going to have the privilege of discussing one particular area which is quite unusual, which is biorobotics. Uh, yes, there is a search for artificial intelligence going on, but there's also some very interesting work being done on biorobotics. Robotic equipment not only exists in factories, as we well know, but also in uh, uh, biological institutes, in the storage of samples, uh, uh, and it's becoming cheaper and cheaper. This is a graph from The Economist in 2008 that shows the costs of replacing uh, human workers in factories by robots. So the robots are here to stay, and the question is, how does the biology link to them? Well, uh, Rubinsky and Juan in Berkeley did the biotransistor back in 2000, and since then, of course, we've had a question of can cyborgs really exist? And we'll hear from the real pioneers, those who actually build robots for a living, like Bruno Mezzoni, and that's his little friend Nao, whom you will be seeing later uh, tomorrow. 
Paolo Dario, who mimics uh, the studies of animals for the benefit of humans, and uh, uh, Hiroshi Ishiguro, who uh, is designing geminoids, which look exactly like uh, humans. And uh, I guess the first application is to have one that you can put at your desk while you go out and play and let the boss think that you're still, <laughs> you're still working. But the geminoids are very good. You can't tell who's who. But we have actually, if I may say with us, uh, another great pioneer of a different sort, Kevin Warwick, who can rightly be called, I think, the first cyborg, because he has actually implanted the chip and it interacts with his own body. Miguel Nicolelis is an old uh, uh, friend and pioneer who has been dealing with reading the brain waves of uh, monkeys and leading that to actual robots linking between the USA and Japan and many other fascinating experiments. And he started with uh, a beautiful small monkey called Bell on these issues. But anything that deals with biology, whether it's biorobotics or other things, raises ethical issues. And I used to use this graph back in the 90s. And I used to say, where are we going in biotechnology? And I put 2000, 2010. You know, we are now on the second rung of this ladder. And I said, you know, I think we will be assembling genomes like Lego pieces in the future. And we used to laugh that uh, we would be producing corn that looks like that. But this is actually not a cartoon. Huh? This one is a cartoon. This is real. This cucumber is real. So, uh, uh, you know, cartoon, reality. A lot of interesting things going on around the world. But Assembling genomes has already happened. And in June 2007, already, Craig Venter of Venter Institute talked about synthetic life forms and, in fact, filed a patent, uh, both in the United States and in uh, WIPO on this. And uh, the DNA molecule was constructed from scratch, inserted into an oocyte, and gotten to, to uh, uh, express itself. And the purpose of that was to create new biofuels from single cell organisms. And in essence, the question is, why not? Because we're already harnessing yeast as a factory, and the doctors know that uh, uh, artemisinin, which is essential for malaria, quinine-resistant malaria, is now being done uh, actually with support from the Gates Foundation uh, in yeast. Another and separate effort, George Church at Harvard is planning to do something, and he started talking about the publication uh, as of last year, and we expect something this year on uh, creating a cell from scratch, amino acid by amino acid. I don't know how far he is. Last time I spoke to him about a year, a little over a year ago, a uh, year and a half ago, he said to me that he was on track. Uh, we were together in New York with Kofi Annan on a biotechnology group, and uh, uh, Mahmoud is here also was in charge of Merck vaccines at the time, was in that group, and we discussed these issues en passant. But there's a group of people who are actually dealing with synthetic biology, and uh, they're raising some transformative questions about how the discipline may go into the future. Uh, that's the synthetic part. But the real life part, we, and again here as a librarian I speak, I'm very happy to offer you the Encyclopedia of Life. And this is a major project with uh, most of the big institutions of the world. And the idea is to go on site. We have a home page from which you can go to 1.9 million pages, each of which is devoted to one species. And behind that are 300 to 600 million pages of scientific literature on biodiversity. That's the plan. So that's how it would look like. At present, we have about 170,000 of the 1.8 million pages have been digitized, and about 30 million of the 300 to 600 million pages have been digitized in what we call the Biodiversity Heritage Library. And you can visit it in this, and we're now working EOL.org, and we're working with uh, the Arab group to organize an Arab EOL, a contribution to it. That's the home page, and you can go from there and choose where you want to go. And sample species pages look like that. Picture, name, origin, source, etc. positioning. And archaea, bacteria, chromista, fungi,
plants, protozoa, viruses, every one of them has its own uh, species page. And the first regional UL's was with China, the second was with us for the Arab world, and I'm very happy to welcome the group of scientists uh, from the Arab world working on biodiversity who will be implementing this project into reality. And this is already the governance structure which we've done, a committee with all major institutions, an executive committee that runs the day-to-day -day affairs, then IT libraries, translation and science, with the Science Advisory Council that advises the groups, and then the connection with the biodiversity uh, convention focal points, and then the scientists are organized in working groups dealing with their specialties, whether they be mammals, plants, insects, etc. And we even have a special TV science series episode devoted to the EOL. So my friends, science is advancing every day, the technology is like magic, the Arab world is falling behind. Whoops. It's a fact. We got to recognize that. Let me show you why. This is the percentage distribution of titles, titles of Arabic and English reading material. And you will note that in science and technology we have 8%, they have 20. In social sciences, the Arabic is 23 and they have 35. So 55% is in the sciences, whether social sciences or natural sciences. On the other hand, religion we've got 25% and they've got four and language and literature we have 23% and they have 14. So you can see the relative weight of that. And for all our Egyptian and Arab friends, these are titles. When you go to the book fair or you go to the, to the book stores, you will find 10 editions of Fatawi ibn Taymiyyah. Here they're counted as one. You will find 10 editions of Riyadh al-Salihin. It's counted as one. So that count even understates the imbalance in between science and heritage, one could call it. So we're falling behind. And that requires public education. The media, unfortunately, does not help educate the public sufficiently about these issues. And scientists are not sufficiently engaged. The scientists are not reaching out. And that's why we did our own TV series. Uh, there are two preliminary episodes which will be shown during lunch breaks here. We need capacity support, and building capacity for science has to recognize these differences, which I mentioned before. We must fix up on building our own capacity. In some countries, you cannot build capacity by collaboration. In some more proficient and advanced countries, like Egypt, you can build through collaboration. This has been studied by the academies, the Inter-Academy Council that uh, uh, Hamad Hassan spoke about. I had the privilege, along with the current president of TWAS and myself, to, to present on behalf of all the scientists of the world to Kofi Annan, UNDP, and the World Bank, uh, the findings of science on this. And what we need are these five clusters, science, policy, human resources, institutions, recognizing the role of the private sector, and financing mechanism. They're all essential, they reinforce each other. But on finance, what we need in our part of the world is to recognize young people. In the US, they have venture capitalists. And here's another one of my favorite pictures, because not only they put pennies and receive huge amounts, but they can recognize talent when they see it. And so they look at this group of young people, and that is Microsoft Corporation 1978. And the question is, would you have invested? And here is Bill Gates, when he was just a kid, like many of those who are here, and Paul Allen and all these guys. The question is, if a bunch of young Egyptian or Arab youth came and said, we have a great idea about something called Windows that's going to change the world and we need two million dollars. Would our industrialists give them the two million dollars, do you think? Well, nowadays, of course, everybody wants to invest in Microsoft, but in those days, that's the trick. So we need to become producers of knowledge, not just consumers of technology. We need to transform rhetoric into action. We've had many past declarations, many government announcements. But as my friend Zapiro has said, it doesn't equal action. In fact, it is a sad thing, and I use that quotation in my opening statement with Jack Duf in Montpellier. We have the capacity to eliminate hunger from the face of the earth in our lifetime. We need only the will. 
So spoke Jack Kennedy, President Kennedy in 1963, in the World Food Congress 1963. Today, the number of hungry people has grown. Despite a global commitment by all the leaders of the world in 2000, to put it as the number one Millennium Development Goal, it has grown. What went wrong? Well, again, Zapiro of South Africa has a beautiful cartoon. This is supposed to be an African Union, but it could be anything else. You know, French to English, English to Swahili, English into Arabic, Arabic into French, rhetoric into action. We're still missing a key translator. Luckily, we have with us some real translators like Dr. Hani Hilal and Dr. Hind Hanafi. Welcome both of you here. We can make it happen. Can we catch up in science? Can we compete? I say yes, Korea did it, Taiwan did it, Singapore did it, and we can do it. And we here are proud to join with the artisans of a better future. So let us dare to dream, dare to be bold, and we can do things differently, and we can succeed. And I will remind you with two dreams that seemed impossible. Antarctica, when it was so-called rediscovered, immediately people wanted to bring in the bulldozers and the industry and mining and minerals and money and build military bases. And then a group of idealists, including my late friend Jack Cousteau, said, no, let's keep the wilderness pristine. Let's keep it for all of humanity. Let's keep it for science. And people said, are you out of your mind? Do you mean you want a whole continent just left to the penguins? And he said, yes. And guess what? We succeeded. We got the Antarctica Agreement, and Antarctica was not colonized as some people would have. And in 1963, those of us like me, of a certain age who studied in the United States, remember the battles for civil rights. The late Martin Luther King stood in Washington, D.C. and said, I have a dream. And it was a dream. I have a dream that my children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Well, it seemed a faraway dream, but it was actually realized. It happened. And the audacity of hope must stay with us. And Margaret Mead has told us, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. So let us out of this gathering move beyond the knowledge and the understanding to action. Let us work together, for there is so much we can do for a whole generation and for the whole world. And for the Egyptians and the Arabs here, I say our youth may look weak and unprepared and the competition may look fierce, but I say we shall surprise the world. <laughs> Thank you.